I'm independent director of the National Alternative Investment Management Association and independent advisor to a number of GPs in private equity, real estate and venture capital. And our today's speakers include Stefana Virgili, CEO of Pocket Money, Jason King, managing partner of CGS, Karen Yu, co-founder of Blockchain Mastery Labs, Anna Mira, business development and media at National Crowdfunding and Fintech Association. And our today's discussion is devoted to the loss of investments during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, let me introduce you my colleague, co-moderator co co today, Sony Mahanti. She's the regional director of Let Token from Singapore. Sony, hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Sunny Mohanty here. I'm the regional director of Law Token based in Singapore. Welcome to yet another session of Law Token VCTV. Uh, I would like to start the session today by introducing our keynote speaker. So the first keynote speaker we have is Stefano Vagili. He's a CEO of Pocket Money. Um, he has been a serial entrepreneur with multiple businesses in Europe, Southeast Asia, Middle East and Africa and he has helped advise and mentor many ICOs in the past. And today he's gonna to talk about how to help new startups with new tokens launch a successful token. Um, over to you, Stefano. Thank you, Sunny. Um, I'll make it quick. I just want to introduce uh, Pocket Money, which is the startup that I funded two years ago. Is a blockchain-based wallet um, with a multi-currency and 0.1% transaction fee that we are pushing into um, emerging markets and uh, developing countries as a way to circulate uh, currency in uh, more stable value. Um, my love and hate for blockchain and cryptocurrency started in 2017. Um, I made good money. I lost more, more money. I made again good money. <laughs> it's up and down. It's a roller coaster life. I've seen uh, hundreds of pitches over the past uh, uh, three years. I travel at least 25 of the 65 countries that I've visited because of blockchain. And some of the pitches that I've seen were total disaster, but some of them, they were really good. And I'll be very happy to talk about those really good tonight. Thank you for having me uh, among the panel. Thank you, Stefano. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, so the next keynote speaker we have is Anna Nimera, who is the Media and Business Development Advisor at National Crowdfunding and Fintech Association of Canada. She is also the radio and TV host interested in entrepreneurship, fintech, blockchain, digital currency, and crypto economy. And the topic she's going to talk about today is the importance of BTC in the economic downturn and the cashless society, um, the importance of fintech in that. Over to you, Anna. Thank you so much for having me in the panel. Uh, I'm very honored to be with such a great speakers here. Um, so uh, I started actually my career in finance um, and was a brick and mortar working for the brokerage firm that actually taught me a lot about the companies, about investment, about trading, about clearing and settlement. And um, eventually also knowing that much, you starting to see what else can be done. So that prompted me actually towards FinTech and FinTech development and what it can be done and how banks or different platforms, financial platforms can be um, adjusted and, and innovated. And that eventually pushed me towards uh, blockchain and being interested also in the um, digital, um, digital currency, crypto economy, how everything can be tokenized, how um, economy can change and actually improve our lives. Can, how can we um, become, yes, in a way cashless society, but um, having all this smoothless transition into it, improving our lives. So um, in the current situation, what is happening right now, we talking about possibility of inflation, we talking about possibility of deflation. So from the economic and financial standpoint of view, um, historically looking at it, we can see that a lot of people were turning into gold in the past. So what options we have now? We are in the 21st century and we are in the era of um, Bitcoin in, uh, in Ethereum and, and different cryptocurrencies. So what is, is it something like a digital gold? And we can say, yes, it's, it's a Bitcoin. So looking from that perspective, we can actually see 
how that particular platform um, can help us in the current situation and possibly even be an alternative for us um, when it comes to the investment. Thank you. Oh, fantastic. Thank you, Anna. Thanks a lot. So the next keynote speaker we have is Karen Mew, who is the co-founder of Blockchain Mastery Labs. Her mission is to brew an organic crypto generation, OCG, with comics on the impact of blockchain to our life. In 2016, she was the first Singapore, um, she was first in Singapore to write a book on cryptocurrency, new assets, right on the cryptocurrency wave. Over to you, Karen. Thank you very much, Sony. So this is my second book. It's called uh, Wish I Knew. So what I did was I challenged myself to make it easier for people to understand the blockchain technology, how it implicates our, um, how it improves our lives. So I put it into a comic so that hopefully people who are fearful of the technology will um, at least read a comic and understand the implications. And then after that, I hope that they will further take the baby steps to further explore and understand because, you know, especially the last four years, a lot of things have changed and uh, we can see that uh, the projects are maturing. Um, some are for real, uh, we can see enterprise taking part on a bit. And I feel that for everybody to take steps to understand it's important because it is, there's a huge learning curve and things change all the time. So it's important for, I, I encourage everybody to really learn about blockchain technology because it's just like, it reminds me of the internet revolution whereby everything changes. And if you were the early ones who got some shares of Google or Facebook, right, you might have retired. So I think the same thing will happen to the crypto world. And I hope that everybody will look at it just um, to gain this advantage. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for inviting me. Okay, so what do you think about the importance of marketing and PR in the successful launch of the token sale? Um, I think the most important thing is um, a lot of the IC IEOs out there, right? Before they do the IEO, they fail to make a market analysis of the current climate of the cryptocurrency investment first. I think this is the first thing. So first you have to um, an an analyze the climate are the people investing at this point of time? That's the first thing. Secondly, right, where are they investing? What kind of projects are they investing? Is your project the kind of project that the mass market will understand? Because when you talk about IEO, most probably you're looking at uh, projects for the retail people, right? Then the project has to be something very simple and you have to have partnerships or brand names that a consumer will be able to associate with or understand. If your project is very technical and it's for enterprise, then I would say, maybe IEO shouldn't be the right, right route. So I think the kind of projects market analysis is very important. And then on top of that, IEO, there's three parts to it. First, you have analyze. Second, you have to make sure that during the IEO, right, you want to make sure that before that, you already got all the KOLs, all the influencer, the community, the right communities who have invested in similar projects before, who knows or understand this kind of projects may want to look at your projects. So you roughly have a base of how many people may do pre-investment. I think if you have very good um, promotions and, um, and airdrops, for example, right, to see what's the reaction from the market, you'll be able to gauge whether people, are, pe people like your project or not. Would they invest in the project? If let's say the pre-sales or the airdrops, you already feel like it's not it's lukewarm, right? Then you have to really think, I, is your project suitable for IO at this moment? Maybe you should build up more, get your community, um, and then make sure that you have partnerships in line, whereby it will then attract people to invest in your projects. I think that's important. And then after that, you must have a continuous plan. You know, what are all the good news that you can come up with? What's the promotion? Do you have staking programs? And things like that to make sure that your um, community, right, stays excited and want to continue to support your project. I think that's important. Yeah, thank you. Excellent, Karen. Very, very uh, good points about uh, to launch a successful token sale. We're going to discuss later in details about that. So we have our next keynote speaker, Jason King, who is the managing partner of CGS Group. 
one of the leading management consultancy firms based in Dubai on all things crypto and blockchain. As a serial cryptocurrency and blockchain technology investor, he invested alongside of world-class crypto hedge funds such as Polychain Capital and FBG Capital in projects like Metal Pay and many more generating ROIs over plus 10,000 percentage over lifetime investments. Um, welcome, Jason. So we would like to hear from you uh, to speak about speak about investments in crypto um, during the pandemic right now and beyond the pandemic. What are your thoughts on that? Thank you. You are on mute, Jason. Hello, Sunny. Hey. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, everyone, for listening in. Uh, Jason here uh, from Dubai. Um, thank you for the kind introduction. I think you kind of covered um, quite a few points um, regarding recently, you know, especially since uh, January until now, we have seen the COVID-19 have rapidly changed um, the global landscape. Uh, and I think just came, just coming out of uh, crypto winter the last uh, two, three years, you know, and now we kind of go into another downturn. I think in terms of ICO and IEOs, uh, personally, I think that the, the hype or, or the same business strategies that were employed and, and rationalized by a lot of projects during those era now have to innovate and rethink about the, the way that funds are being raised. I do think that the days where, you know, investor can go out there and just rack up, you know, millions of dollars uh, with simply, you know, white paper and, and some, you know, nice talks is done. Uh, so one of the things that we look at, uh, obviously, that we've been focused on for the last few years is um, infrastructure. So one of the companies that I'm part of, and also we have invested early on, is Elf. Uh, Elf is an enterprise blockchain solution from uh, based in Beijing. We also did a, we did not do an ICO during 2017 when we launched three years ago. Instead, we have gathered uh, many prominent funds, uh, as you can probably read on our website. And we have partnered up with many exchanges. Um, one of the special things that we have uh, been building over the last few years, and it's actually close to main at launch, is our ability. Uh, first of all, ELF is a proprietary blockchain based uh, completely from the ground up. Uh, it is certified by the CESI, which is a Chinese uh, an institution for the technologies uh, founded in 1973, which it has actually certified only around 30 companies around the world in terms of blockchain tech. Uh, including Alibaba and uh, Lenivo. Uh, and our technology is also certified by uh, Microsoft uh, Cloud, Huawei Cloud, Google Cloud, and also uh, Amazon AWS. So we're focused on de delivering high speed, high performance, and also uh, parallel processing blockchain with complete sharding and side chain technology with smart contracts and EVM to make it very easy for businesses or SMEs to deploy various kinds of applications and dApps uh, on the blockchain, because we believe that it's not every business's business to build blockchains. And we are, Elf is a specialized firm in developing easy to use blockchains. Similarly, like how Apple designs, you know, very easy to use solution for consumer usage. Um, so that's, that's some of the things that we have seen, especially the last uh, few months, we had some projects, you know, most. Many of the projects that we actually work with uh, that deploy our technology or partner up with our technology are real world firms that already are established market leaders or um, have produced us, uh, you know, traction in the market given their existing business model and where we see we can implement blockchain technology very easily for them uh, to improve their business. And especially during the COVID, we have seen, you know, increases somewhere from even 30 to 40 percent in revenue. And we're talking about companies with revenues of well over $100 million a year. So I think the, the time to go digital for all businesses, if they have already not been doing so, uh, this is the time now. And digital infrastructure is even more important than ever for all businesses, no matter if you're physical or, or uh, electronic or digital. Uh, that's some of the points I would like to share. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jason. Uh, amazing points about that. Companies who are waiting, please go digital. Okay, we're going to discuss more on those lines, uh, but now I'd like to pass the floor to my colleague, Nadia, who's going to uh, moderate the pitch competition. Thank you, Nadia. Over to you. 
Thank you. And um, our today's first participant of the beach competition is Gary Spence. Hi, uh, Gary. Hello. Hello, how are you? Great, thank you. So could you please start with a brief introduction on yourself and the company? Yeah, so I'm Gary Spence. I'm the CEO and founder of Yotta Laboratories based in the UK. And we've also got a presence in Singapore as well. So we are a technology company that research and develop new emerging technologies, blockchain being one of them, but also specialize around AI, machine learning, um, and also uh, heavily involved in smart city, smart nation technology. Uh, thank you, Gary. Could you also share a pitch deck with us uh, with your um, elevator pitch for all the investor panel participants? Sure. Thank you. Can you see? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Okay. So we are a privately owned company. Um, we've been going since 2012. Yotta was formed in 2014 uh, by myself and Professor El Hajj Ben Khalifa. Um, and as I say, we, we specialize in the research and development of new technologies. Blockchain came to the forefront for us many years ago, and we have done over 150 research cases now um, on the utilization of blockchain, but also how it can be incorporated into full ecosystems. So not just standalone blockchain, um, so how it can be incorporated into business. So... We have seen um, over the years the demand for um, data storage and also how that looks in the future. So we have also designed our own decentralized cloud network, which we call the Yotta Cube, and it can be rapidly deployed in node storage format uh, across dense locations, Singapore being prime, there isn't a location where you can build big data warehouses and, and storage, but you've got multiple buildings that you can deploy the cube itself into um, existing buildings. So you can build data set, virtual data centers just by adding the cubes in there. But the cube is also a part of our ecosystem that allows it to be a platform as well. So it's a platform as a service as well as cloud. And we are now moving into a new era. Um, I first wrote our token back in 2017. And, and we, we thought at the time with the hype around tokens, it wasn't right for us. Um, but we are now moving into that era. When when we first wrote it, Ethereum was at $33. So a lot of people will understand how long ago that was. Um, so we are now launching our own YEDS token and also bringing in partners globally uh, to be part of the Yotta network. So we, we can expand. So Yotta is also a partnership company that we can bring others on board and we can host under the Yotta brand and our trademarking. So just as a quick overview of how the cube actually works, um, we've done a map of the UK, but this can be anywhere. And it's a, a decentralized cloud data center uh, using DLT technology, but also uh, having smart contracts and blockchain and a enableability on there as well. Um, so the cubes can be anything from a small NAS up to several petabytes. So our mission is to create a true holistic decentralized network of companies under the Yotta. Um, 
And to do that, we are having discussions across UAE, India, and Asia, and also um, with our partners in Australia as well. So we, we have got several big targets. We're bringing on board um, various VCs, and we're doing our IEO uh, probably in August um, and building this traction as we go along. And having the token as a utility that can be used within our network. So it's a true utility token um, for the benefit of everybody within the Yotta network, um, whether that is to utilize for paying for services and items and also to launch products as well. So the tokens themselves, uh, we're looking to reinvest. We're also uh, developing at the moment our own wallet and exchange. And we are planning on our own Visa prepaid card system as well, uh, working with our partner CL Technology. So that is all in the pipeline and they can be utilized across the whole network. Um, so one of the discussions earlier was about bringing products out, being at the forefront all the time. And this is key to us is we see a lot of people who've done tokens, a single product, and it might never get launched, where we're looking at various products and keep on um, revolutionize as we go along and bringing on key partners to work with us at the same time under the Yotta branding system. So our objectives, um, and this is just the start of them, is to educate users on how the platform will work, to encourage innovation by doing uh, keynotes, and to enhance our stakeholders and community participation, and to organically acquire token holders as well. Part of what we are planning on doing is various roadshows. We are bringing in um, various key experts um, across in Tokyo and also across Asia as well um, to enhance one of the key topics at the moment is vertical farming and how that can be sustainability using blockchain and AI technology. Um, that was quite key with the COVID scenario when food security was questionable. And by introducing blockchain into vertical farming is quite key um, for the traceability and the security, but also bringing it to communities as well and reducing carbon footprint. So Yotta itself, um, we are bringing in entrepreneurs, startups and early stages within the Yotta system. Uh, we've got multiple conversations going on at this moment in time uh, with small SMEs who want to be part of a larger organization. And this is where the USP, we believe in Yotta, is that we become the incubator supporter um, all under one brand. And that is our key in the next four to five years is to have the Yotta very similar to how Amazon Alibaba works, but from a, a technical digital perspective. And like Jason was saying earlier about adding that support from our side for companies as well and allowing them to host through us and verification as well. So both new entrepreneurs, investors um, can come into Yotta. Uh, we will uh, support and host. We've got a team of advisors that can also work with new companies. And, and I know from past experience how difficult it is to get into the market. And by having a conglomerate uh, partnership is a lot easier to get items to market. Uh, we're working with 
several people over in Jordan who have got a fantastic IoT system for gas monitoring. Um, but their route to market uh, is quite limited. So through the Yotta system, we can push that out through our global partners as well. So our main topics are obviously smart nation technologies and how that works going forward. Agritech and public transport. IT services um, within blockchain technology, but also traditional IT services. Uh, we're working with several defense and rapid mass transport of how you can digitize um, payment systems that allow people to use uh, multiple currencies that they use RMT. And we're also working across in Australia with a healthcare company and health insurance and how that can be put on to eliminate fraud um, from fraudulent claims. And our primary focus is to work with governments and departments that we are doing with the UK Department of Trade of Industry um, and do quite a lot of seminars with the support of UK DTI um, across Asia and also UAE. So our token, uh, we believe, is a full ecosystem uh, within the global network and what we are planning on doing is bringing on early stage investors and also supporters of Yotta. Um, so we, we are doing a pre-token um, sale at this moment in time, and then do the IEO plan for August 2020. And we're going to ramp up the, the PR and marketing around that in the coming weeks. Um, but this is, one of the launches that we're doing along with uh, LA Token and other platforms as well. So thank you for listening. That's a overview of Yotta um, and what our vision is going forward. And I, I truly believe uh, with the many years that we've done, myself and the team, is that we, we are coming to uh, the market's at the right time, post-COVID. Um, many people are looking at technical solutions um, and also to partner with key individuals as well. Thank you very much, Gary. Could you please uh, stop sharing the screen so that we could move on for the further discussion? Thank you so much. And uh, our next um, uh, pitch is from Brandon Bergson. Hello, Brandon. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. It's an honor to be here um, and uh, excited to, uh, to share my project. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, please. <clears throat> Can you see it? Yes, thank you. Okay, hi, everyone. Again, my name is Brandon Bergeson. I am the founder and CEO of MobiPay. Uh, we are a universal payments and rewards ecosystem. So uh, as a kid, um, I really like to solve problems. And uh, I believe I've solved one of the biggest problems in crypto and blockchain today, which is utilizing cryptocurrency for everyday payments. So at Mobi, we make it easy to spend or send cash or digital currency anywhere in the world from your mobile phone in seconds. So a couple of the biggest problems that I see today in the crypto space, as I mentioned, is using crypto for everyday purchases, the mainstream adoption and the friction uh, of, of onboarding the complicated uh, nature of blockchain and the applications, and commerce uh, for the unbanked. So uh, our hybrid solution includes uh, a, a product suite uh, that are geared for uh, certain different demographics around the world. One is Mobi Wallet, which is our mainstream consumer and banking app. This is being launched in the US. We've, current, we've uh, got our US banking approval through our partners. Uh, we finalized our integration and we're getting ready to launch. Uh, we also have MobiX, which is our crypto digital asset and exchange wallet. 
This is where all the exchange functionality goes into our application. Uh, and we are able to in-app exchange fiat to fiat, crypto to crypto, and uh, cri crypto to fiat, if I said that right, <laughs> uh, within the application. And this is geared and has a user, a user interface really geared towards your crypto enthusiasts. And last but not least, we have MobiPay. So this is a merchant payment gateway that we use as an EPOS. We don't believe in hardware. With our application, you'll be able, as merchants anywhere in the world, to download our application. You'll be able to transact via NFC or QR code. The transaction happens instantly. The greatest thing is that the merchants will be able to accept any form of currency, and we settle in their local fiat currency instantly within the application. Uh, so this is kind of what our, our uh, ecosystem looks like. So what we've done as MobiCoin is our core technology, which is our token built on Stellar. We are a pure utility token. And what our utility token does, is it does a couple different things. One, it acts as a, it acts as a payment gateway or a payment, um, I would say, delivery mechanism for both fiat and crypto, as you know what Stellar does. But it also adds as a, as a, um, a rewards mechanism as well that people can collateralize different rewards from gaming uh, and other industries, and they can actually exchange it for things on the network, or they can exchange it for cash. So what we've done is we've combined a wallet, we've combined rewards, we've uh, combined blockchain, exchange, banking, and merchants into one platform. Now, we are a blockchain agnostic platform, which allows us to do things instantly. We have integrated already with uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Stellar, and uh, Bitcoin Lightning Network. <clears throat> so one, as far as business is concerned, one thing I, I believe that the, the blockchain uh, industry is missing is revenue models. Uh, and we have uh, actually a real business with nine sustainable revenue models that will drive us uh, into the future and, and, and allow us to, to get to the mainstream adoption level where we know we can get. Now, uh, you know, it comes down to, you know, really three important things when you have a company, right? It comes down to technology, it comes down to, it comes down to team and timing. So right now I wanna talk about uh, our team since I just got done talking about our technology. As I mentioned, the founder and CEO, I'll just name a couple people here. Uh, our CTO um, was, the, uh, he built the entire logistic platform for Amazon Prime now uh, here in the US. Uh, so pretty significant. Our founding CTO and board member, he successfully built an, uh, and exited a large uh, fintech company and sold it to the largest company in the UK with over 500 employees. Uh, we have our chief of legal and compliance, uh, Brian O'Neill, who uh, was former SEC and chief legal counsel for the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, we also have Tal Finney, who is a former state controller and uh, director of policy for two governors here in California. And last but not least, we have Peter Mansfield, uh, who is our new CMO. Uh, he has successfully exited a few different companies. Uh, recently, he, um, or not recently, but uh, last year, um, uh, the company called Marketa, actually, that he was a founding C uh, CMO for, and number two of the company, just got valued at $4.3 billion. And he was right hand to the CEO, getting them to that position. Um, so, we, you know, the, the team that we have here is substantial. They, a lot of them do have some blockchain experience, but most of them are real world, real business type of experience. Now, what, what we've done and where this is our secret sauce. So what we've done is we've established retail partnerships. Here's some of them, uh, as you mentioned before, um, I, I believe, uh, I'm not sure it was, I think it was Karen. It was about having actual real world partnerships that can be utilized. So with our technology, you can walk into companies like Target, and you can select a funding source, whether it be US dollars, whether it be Bitcoin or whether it be MobiCoin. Target doesn't need to need, they don't know about what the funding source is. We settle in US dollars. And what that does is allow you to use Bitcoin or digital currency for everyday purchases at some of these biggest brands. Now, this is not just online. This is also in store. And part of our secret sauce as well is our user adoption strategy. Now, I think there's a lot of companies out there that I've seen uh, that may be similar to us, but they don't incentivize users to use the platform. And what we do is we actually, with these brands, we give them rewards, we give them cash back on cash to continue to use, the, uh, use our product. 
but we also give uh, people incentives to refer other people to our platform. These are some of our launch partners. Uh, as I mentioned, we're a Stellar based token. Uh, we have um, Stellar, we have Wax. Uh, we are, we will be focused a lot on the gaming industry. We believe payments and rewards is perfect for uh, our platform and we've, uh, we're establishing some more as we go. But these are some of our launch partners that we have in place. And uh, I'll talk to you more about those here in a minute. Um, so here's their traction uh, to date. So we have U.S. banking and custody for both consumers and businesses. Our entire backend dashboard is built and live in beta. Our merchant checkout APIs and SDK are built uh, and currently being uh, integrated with some of our partners. Our in-app currency exchange is built uh, for instant conversion. Now we're really focused on user experience compared to some of the other, uh, you know, companies like Changely uh, that require a lot of long string of uh, numbers and, and letters and, and different uh, wallet addresses. We actually do it really quickly in the app. Uh, we have a liquidity provider, uh, 350 different uh, retail partnerships established in the U.S. alone. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, we are gearing up for, we've been pre-approved for an IEO, mm -hmm. uh, a tier one exchange, um, but uh, we're not really allowed to expose who that is at this point. Um, so we have about $950,000 in the project so well, uh, so excuse me, so far. Uh, we are doing a, a token sale with a $5 million hard cap. We're also doing a traditional seed round with traditional funds or VCs, angel investors for a million. Uh, and this is our use of proceeds, uh, as you can see. These are a lot of our milestones. Uh, it's a lot of stuff to read here, but uh, these are our milestones and where we're at. Uh, we're getting ready to actually physically launch the company and we will start to onboard a lot of our partners. One of our partners is a ride share company here in the US. Uh, that gives 100% of the ride fare to the drivers, and they're going to be utilizing for their in-app payments uh, and their uh, payouts to uh, their influencers, which is a, uh, one of our uh, a big attributes that we have. We're able to pay out people instantly in-app um, within the uh, within our um, with just uploading a spreadsheet, and you, it, they can settle on any currency that they're liquid on. Sorry, uh, and. These are some of the additional use cases that we have. Obviously we talked about retail. Uh, we have tra uh, transportation is one, global payroll, uh, the SMEs, SMBs, depending on um, what you uh, call and where you're at in the world. Uh, the gig economy, uh, that's really a big, a big thing for us is we're able to uh, pay people globally instantly within the app. Uh, events, uh, esports and gaming, nonprofit in the, uh, the cannabis industry. Uh, so uh, from an investment standpoint, we're doing a private utility token sale for accredited investors only. Um, and then we're also doing a convertible note uh, tra for traditional investors, as I mentioned before. And um, this, is our, this is our contact information if you guys want more information, uh, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys may have. And uh, thanks for having me today. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Brandon. And Sony, could you please get back with the questions? Um, thank you, Nadia. So judges, uh, we would like to uh, hear your feedback about the projects. Um, so <laughs> let's start with Stefano. You're on mute, Stefano. Yeah, super excited to talk about these two projects. First of all, Brandon and Gary, I'm a friend. I'm a guy like everyone else. And when I talk about work, sometimes I say things that are only pertaining to the realm of work. It's got nothing to do with who you are. And I'm going to tell you a few things that are good and a few things that are very bad, especially you, Gary. Your presentation was the ugliest PowerPoint that I've seen in my entire life. It was like looking at a PowerPoint, like reading a book with ugly pictures. When you were talking about vertical farms, there were three black boxes on the, on the slide. Why don't you put a vertical farm there? When you were talking about uh, uh, distributed, uh, the decentralized network, you put a picture of the UK that looks the most centralized thing that I've ever seen. A center point with spaghetti that sticks out of it. You have to work with your, on your presentation. Those black boxes with left uh, justification and white text on it don't work. You will never sell a coin, a token to any one of these millennials that are putting their money into it. These are the bad things. The good thing is that 
you got a fantastic technology. Technology is really, really super interesting. And you've been around for very long. You can capitalize on your expertise. And I think that's where you have to, to work hard. And I'm very happy to hear that you are about to start uh, your marketing campaign in the next few weeks. I would strongly suggest you uh, bring on board someone that knows how to communicate visually because the cryptocurrency and blockchain industry is heavily based on routing. Like a Singaporean might support Liverpool, which is a football team 8,000 miles away. Cryptocurrency works the same way. They support, the, the investor supports teams and projects that are close to the heart for the way they look like. You've got a great logo, you've got great iconography behind you, great font typography. I love typography, but the presentation has nothing to do with that. So work hard on that, get a chief marketing officer to plan the entire strategy for you, and then start with your IEO. Uh, Brendan. For you, it's the other way around. I would say your presentation was stunning, really beautiful. You talk about investment strategy. You talk about the team. You talk about all the things that Gary did not talk about. But I got bad news for you. And the bad news is that people don't spend cryptos. And the reason why people don't spend cryptos is because you make money with cryptos. Last week, I made 16% on Cardano while I was sleeping. Why would I ever go and buy a coffee at Starbucks with my cryptocurrencies? if I can make 16% overnight of an investment. That's the most challenging part of any other company and startup that decided to use cryptocurrency to pay. Is the, the, the lack of adoption is because you've got three types of users now that are holding on to their cryptos. Those that have forgotten about their cryptos and they are keeping their cryptos there because after 14 of January 2018, they saw their uh, value go down and they are hoping that one day it will go up again. Then you have the second type is the one that carefully and meticulously invests. And then sometimes you get lucky, sometimes you don't get lucky. And then you have the, tar the third type, those that have enough cryptos to give them to a uh, bot that invests on their behalf and it makes profits for them. And they will never touch those cryptos. The category one and the category three, they will never touch their cryptos. Or if they touch, they will touch a, sh a small portion of it. Those in the middle are those that are useful in your use case. And you see probably a couple of weeks ago, you, you would have seen on Binance the volumes for Bitcoin jumping from 300 million to 1.6 billion in the span of 48 hours. That's the amount of money that you want to target. Those that are interested in profiting, uh, profiting out of your token. But the thing is that your token doesn't offer an opportunity to profit. It, of, it offers an opportunity to spend it. And that's where I'm a bit resistant on that. But I think you are communicating fantastically and you are ready for an IEO. Fantastic points. That Stefano is the expert, both of you, both the projects you pitched. Thank you for that. Uh, next, I would like to hear from Karen. What's your feedback on both the projects? Thank you. Hi. Um, I, I think for Gary's project, right, it's a little bit too technical for a retail market. It sounds more like something that uh, enterprises may understand better and or businesses may understand. I don't see the retail people being able to understand. So maybe you want to relook. I, I don't know what's your marketing strategy, but if you are going to have IEO, then you're, you may you want to focus more on entrepreneurs and enterprises who may understand it better. Because, and visually, I agree with Stefano that I think visually it has to be much better for people to appreciate your project. Um, and for um, Brandon, uh, of course, the presentation is really very nice, but I would like to know uh, where, because I saw a lot of nice brands, you know, all the top brands are on the presentation. Are you going to launch this in which area? Because I, I feel that um, in mature, mature uh, economy like Singapore or America, right? We don't really want to use our crypto like what Stefano said because we want to hodl it and we can already make money from it just by hodling it, by loaning it out, things like that. But if you placed it for people who have to use crypto like Venezuela, Argentina, Chile, or some parts of the South Africa places that their currency has little use or is hyperinflated and they have no choice but to use uh, cryptocurrency, then I think mass adoption will, will take place and, and these are the places that maybe may need a solution like yours. 
So it depends on where are you going to launch this. Yeah, that's mine. And, and I appreciate the uh, the feedback, and I, I should have done a better job of my messaging. And so we built this on blockchain. We knowing that this will be the future, and we do realize that no one's going to be you know really utilizing their crypto for for everyday purchases. But it's still a big problem that will need to be fixed overall. So what we've done is we've created a mainstream consumer banking app and a crypto app. So our mainstream consumer banking app will get all the mainstream users, all the millennials, everyone. We have a very crazy user adoption strategy for every day from, from teenagers to grandma in the U.S. We're starting with that in the U.S. and Canada. Separate to that, our Mobi X application, which is our crypto asset wallet, will be launching in other countries like Africa, other partners that allow us for the, the remittance of the token to be used. And that's where the technology will come in place. So we're doing this strategically knowing that very few people right now will utilize it, but if we build a, a two-part two demographic or a two-part strategy and we merge those apps in the next five or 10 years, that's really our strategy. So we're launching in the U.S. with the U.S. banking, everything that, and that's strictly for the mainstream consumer and the cashback rewards and all that, but the cryptocurrency is still the, 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 the remittance piece, the token, when you're sending it overseas, you're sending it to grandma in Mexico, you're sending to those places, then we can utilize our system to that utility of the remittance piece can be used in those areas. I hope you have deep pockets for marketing such projects because there are many, quite a few projects that are aiming to do the similar things. So I guess marketing it and getting people to adopt it will be your, maybe your biggest challenge. Yeah, well, that, that's the greatest thing. We have a B two B to C strategy. So, just for instance, one one of our partners alone is onboarding uh, two hundred thousand active users just for the rideshare company that need to use our app in order to transact. So, they actually push the marketing for us, and that's really what our growth strategy is. All of our partners, we have about three or four top ten currencies that will be pushing uh, on the even on the blockchain side. We'll be pushing people to download Mobi because their their token then is be able to use at these retailers. So that's why you see some of the partnerships in place. They'll be pushing our user base for us, and as we grow, and that's stage one of our go to market plan. Thank you, thank you, Karen. Uh, next, we'd like to move to Anna. Like to hear from you your feedback on both the projects. Yes. So, well, actually, um, both of the judges before me said it so much that there is really not much um, to add to it. But uh, my main point is I have to agree with Stefano when it comes to the presentation of IOTA. It's, it's a very technical presentation. And usually when you're presenting on the PowerPoint, it's extremely important to be visual. This is what actually speaks to people. If you're putting actually a text and it's very crowded, it's extremely difficult to read it. So, um, so when it comes to the presentation, it has to be really crisp and the less is more. Um, so that uh, when it comes to the presentation and um, when it comes to um, what you are offering in your project, yes, maybe it's not that much of the retail oriented, it's very technology oriented and technology um, speaking, it, it, it just cutters into this particular industry. So it's just like everything also depends when there is one presentation, it also depends uh, with whom you are dealing with and you actually um, kind of customizing depending on the project you are, you are doing. Um, when it comes to uh, MobiPay, um, uh, again, yes, we are not at this particular stage when we are paying for coffee with, with cryptocurrency. But looking from the financial perspective, um, you never know what is going to happen in the future. But again, it comes something, what is going to happen with the, with the currencies. Right now, they are being supported um, through the governments. But uh, of course, um, like I mentioned right at the beginning at my introductory um, short speech, um, there is a possibility of inflation. There is a possibility of deflation. We, can, we are going to actually see what is happening. And um, what has... Um, you know, the, the uh, cash becomes king, but at the same time, when there's a deflation, but maybe there's an alternative to it. And one of those alternatives might be actually uh, cryptocurrency payment or Bitcoin payment, or um, we're not talking about right now, we're talking about the future. So I'm looking from that particular, uh, for this particular company, from the perspective of they already looking into the future and possibility that 
Bitcoin or um, altcoins are not just like a medium of investment, but the medium of exchange as well. So um, it, it is a good project. It's a good presentation, but at the same time, it needs to be also adjusted to the present time, not just looking into the future. Excellent. Thank you, Anna. Thanks for those feedback. Next, we have Jason. Jason would like to hear your feedback about both the projects. Thank you. Hello. Hi, Sunny. Um, for the first project uh, for Yota Laboratories, um, I think the concept of a distributed um, data storage is quite important. Um, now, from the presentation, obviously, everyone said that the slides are not so pretty. Um, I mean, it, it depends on what, I mean, some of the most, let, let's look at Bitcoin, right? I mean, when Bitcoin first came out, it's a piece of paper uh, written by Satoshi Nakamoto on, that was posted on the internet webpage. And the first version of uh, Satoshi Client was also very, you know, primitive and, and normal looking. And I think that if you do have innovative technology that you feel that is very strong, um, I will highly advise you when you pitch your project, uh, I will focus more particularly on the innovations, like what, what, for example, and, and also incentives, right? Let's say someone wants to run your box. For the average consumer of today, for me, if I have one of your box, like what do I have? Um, in terms of Bitcoin, in the early days, if, if someone was running Satoshi clients, they usually can, you know, eventually they stumble upon the mining function you know, when they fumble with the menu and they could discover, oh, I can earn some Bitcoins by mining. What is mining? And, and there must be inherent um, incentive natures built into your project. For example, if you're convincing someone to buy your box, what are, focus more on what can the person get when they participate with your project, especially if you are going for IEO or public. You know, the general audio, uh, audience does not understand the intricacies of your technology. So that's why I would love tomorrow. Um, as for MobiPay, um, now like prior, I think maybe three, four years ago, like someone, um, I think it was Karen, Karen said that there are many competition to what you are aiming to do. Me personally, I think that one of the strong use cases back maybe a few years ago was you had, I, I've used BitPay where you can load Bitcoins and now I, for sure they offer a lot more uh, a lot more uh, options where you can load different cryptos. I think there are many, many um, competitors or similar products that have attempted to launch or have launched. Uh, one of the most important thing that you will have to encounter is regulatory issues. Uh, I think in the US especially, um, I think there are uh, money transmission licenses that depending on how you approach the problem, if you already have a banking partner that will help you facilitate nationally, then that's great. But if not, you are going to go down the path of uh, obtaining MSBs or MTLs across 50 states. And that can be a very heavy endeavor considering each state. Some states can cost between half a million to $2 million a year just on maintaining these licenses. Um, now to kind of wrap that up, for me personally, every day what I use, I download Trust Wallet from Binance and I use Ethereum and uh, USDT. And I think even, even just the sheer fact that you can convince a merchant to accept USDT and the fact that they can take it to any exchange and liquidate it for, you know, whether it's Bitcoins or local currency is a very strong uh, dominant player in the market right now that is not quite, you know, it's very crypto centric. Like if you're just an average Joe, I don't think someone knows how to use like USDT and, you know, fumble with Ethereum. But for the savvy crypto users, I think, most of us agree that I can use USDT to make global payments. I use this as my USD account, you know, uh, versus traditional banking account where I don't have to deal with all the headache uh, until we find a way to maybe if you, if MobiPay was going to make some innovation target where it makes it super easy, where Tether and uh, Trust Wallet have built, uh, you know, kind of the, the points of decentralization for the user where I don't have to worry about my bank saying, hey, sorry, Jason, I don't want to send this money for you. Or if it's, you know, 12 or 2 a.m. in the midnight, I need to send some money across the globe. I could just do it via my wallet to any. And I think the peer to peer cash component is very, very strong. Uh, I mean, again, this is just my personal opinions on, on consumer applications. And also another big competition you have to kind of keep in count is that nationalized 
uh, cryptocurrency. Similarly, if you've seen China have just launched a digital currency uh, issued by the central bank. And I think more and more you're going, to, you're going to see central bank issue digital currency become more prominent. How are you going to adapt to those changes and how, what can you offer to the end user to make their experience more seamless? So I think at the end of the day, um, for these mobile payment applications, definitely utility is key. If I can take your wallet today and I can go to, for example, pay for all these services and goods that I normally already used to, and I don't really have to change my behavior because I think if you are attempting to change the user behavior, it's going to become very expensive, no matter how much marketing and PR dollars you spend. That's my few cents. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot, Jason. That's a very, very comprehensive feedback so far. Thanks a lot. Okay, so before we uh, close the session today, because we just have a couple more minutes, I just want to plug two questions uh, together. Uh, I would like to ask each of the keynote speaker question, followed up by feedback of what you think about these online roadshows or a lot tokens uh, VCTV initiative. I would like to start with Stefano because he has seen a lot of ICOs uh, succeed and fail. So I would like to know from you, what's the main reason? I have to be the devil's advocate today. What's the main reason an IEO is, is going to fail? <laughs> That's a lovely question. I, I think it boils down to the same uh, point. Uh, there are projects that are making money. Basic attention token two weeks ago raised 25% overnight. Uh, there is still appetite for invest, investing in uh, uh, ICOs. I think there's going to be a, a IEOs. There's going to be a second um, youth, um, a second wave of projects of investment on startups that are dealing with uh, blockchain. And I think it's great to do a IEO because that's eventually where the token is going to, to get. And there is no need to reinvent the wheel. We have invented the wheel in 2016, 2014, let's say from Ethereum, August 2014, all the way until like December 2016, January 2017. And that's it. Then the market was exhausted and all the projects went down. The raise of startup projects between January 2018 and 2019 went down 96%. There's no, there were no more, um, no, no, nobody wanted to invest into projects. So the idea that the the uh, exchange like uh, La Token or um, any other exchange decide to support a project from from the beginning and bring it and let it grow is similar to what they are doing on a more institutional level in uh, Europe, uh, where you'll find that the stock market now they allow you to pre-list and then graduate and then finally list in a smaller in a, in a smaller uh, stock market where there is a limit to the cap and then finally graduate to the final stock market. The, the institutional world is already doing it. It's, it's amazing what they are doing in Europe. And I think they, the crypto exchange have the opportunity to do that, to take projects from what uh, Brandon was saying early, uh, sorry, Gary, I think was Gary saying, uh, early stage investor, take the early stage investor and bring them all the way to the success of the project. And on the, at the same time, uh, act as sort of a referee and a quality check on the quality of the project, the quality of the technology, the quality of the team, uh, the, quality, the, the, the quality of the intentions, which was probably one of the major drive away from the ICO where some projects were through scam, just with the intention of launder money for on behalf of someone that had too many Bitcoin or too many Ethereum. So the, the, the role of the exchange, you'll probably remember that, that presentation that I've done, the ex who killed the bull and the bear, and I was blaming the exchanges for destroying the market. I still stand for for what I believe, that the exchanges destroy the ICO market, but at the same time, the exchanges can act as a guarantee by centralizing. Bottom line, the exchanges are centralized because they centralize the decision. They can act as a guarantor against scam and against uh, bad intention. So it's great what you're doing, that you're bringing projects like uh, uh, Yota and uh, MobiPay tonight, and uh, thank you for inviting me as a uh, panelist. Okay, that's from the expert. Thank you, Stefano, for that feedback. Uh, lovely input. Uh, I'd like to ask Karen now. Uh, Karen, what do you think about, so how would you, how would you measure the success of MobiPay? Because they are very good in presentation, marketing maybe. I mean, obviously they, have, they would have the deep pockets to the marketing if they have that. 
So, so because you said that we don't use crypto for payment. So what's a, the key factor uh, for them to be successful in an IEO? They are, they, I would push on the reward side. Look, guys, don't forget that the problem of digital payment was solved in the 50s and the 60s by Visa and MasterCard. You can contactless touch your card on a POS and you're, you're, pay, you're paid in, in 0.2 seconds. Uh, when I pay overseas, I get 2.6% 2.6 times rewards in miles okay. and I can travel the world Stephen for free. Frozen. Oh, have I frozen? Karen, would you like to take that? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, I would say, okay, if you already have Hello? good strategies, yeah. can you hear me? Uh, if you already have like very good strategies whereby you can bring on board like 200,000 users, right? I think that it's like a, a really important news to show at adopt, uh, mass adoption. I, I don't see projects with 200,000 real users who use a solution frequently right now. So if you have something like that, then I think, of course, that will help a lot. But you, it's not, not just one. I think you need to have a series of... You, unfortunately, people like to see all the good news and, and usage of it. So I think if you can pull in the list of the brands that you mentioned and that um, they are the ones who release the information to will help you to build your reputation. So numbers... I think it will help you a lot. And then um, I think Jason also mentioned about all the regulatory um, issues that you may face. And uh, I think even in Singapore, we have a few projects who try to do it and then they feel because of that problem. So if you can um, address to all these issues, uh, all these challenges that other people have already met and why your project will be able to cross over and um, solve this problem, then I think maybe you, uh, you have a much better chance of succeeding. And I hope you'll get, you'll, you'll do well. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Karen. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks for Thank your you. time, Karen, today. What do you think about uh, our VCTV initiative, initiative from La Token? Oh, it's very really nice. I think it's uh, well planned. Um, okay. And uh, you guys are very good in moderating this thing. Thank you very much for inviting me to. Um, I, I guess this is the way, this is the way all of us are gonna have all these events, right? <laughs> for at least an, a year or two. And I think it's great because everybody can be on any, any part of the world, right? So I think it's, yes. it's great. Thank Fantastic. You. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Jason, coming to investments, institutional invest investors or retail investors, so I would like to know from you who are who would be more interested, uh, both Moby Pay and Yota, and why? I mean, for the retail investor, I definitely think Moby Pay. Obviously, it seems more approachable, friendly for the for the you know to the user that has no idea about anything about crypto and blockchain. If both projects were pitched, I would say. Moby pays, I mean, obviously the, the pitch, the, the product, the way, even the presentation. I also note that Brandon's, you know, he wore his t-shirt, with a very clean background. I think those are all things, especially in the virtual space, uh, every little detail do matter. So, and, and but I do, but, but on the other hand, I do think there are a lot of retail um, investors or, or, or that would be highly interested if Yota was able to sort of retell its story in a much more um, captivating manner, I think Yoda would definitely be more captivating um, because Moby, there are a lot of similar you know, products that we can see on the market where Yota can offer something more unique. It's just the way it was presented. It doesn't really resonate with the average retail person. Um, so I think both can, can do well in actually an actual retail market. But I definitely do think there are a lot of refinements uh, that, that can be done. Um, yeah, that's my thoughts. Excellent. That's for uh, both yeah. the projects you take a note of. Thank you, Jason. Uh, last, and I would like to know, what do you think about uh, the strengths of both the projects in terms of investments, be it retail or uh, institutional or an IEO? What do, you think, what do you think are the strengths of both the projects in getting funded during this COVID-19 or the time of pandemic? Okay, I'm, I'm going to kind of 
not answer your question directly, but kind of answer the question in a different perspective. I think, first of all, I think La Token being, you know, started being an exchange. And I think you guys are one of the first to sort of captivate, you know, digital media, especially doing, you know, I think the roadshow, the virtual roadshow is such an amazing idea. I think to further kind of mono, uh, whether monopolize or monetize the platform of the effort that you're doing, um, there is actually a project that I've started, um, been working on for the last two years. It's called LivePitches.com. So what, what it's about is that I think if today these two similar projects, and I believe that during road shows, like actually if I go on a road show, let's say I'm in San Fran and I'm like pitching to a room full of investors, out of that room, I will hope someone say, hey, Jason, great project. Um, and, and I think a, a friend of mine, Jason Calacanis, he was an early investor in Uber. So how did he invest into Uber? It wasn't like someone called him and he's like, oh, I got to get into Uber. No, it was like he was at a pier where uh, Travis Klanick was pitching Uber to a room full of investors. Yeah. And uh, after the, the presentation, obviously it resonated with some audience members and a few guys came over and they're like, hey, you know, like your company is great and we would love to give you some money just to get in, right? Because they felt like whatever the presentation and the pitch was really good, uh, the company sounded really promising and uh, Jason wrote a check for uh, $50,000 on the spot to Travis. And wow. that's, I think, further to kind of, and today, of course, that uh, the, those shares are worth north of a billion dollars. You know, so, so what, I, what I'm thinking is that if we can somehow capitalize, if you remember Kickstarter, right? The, the, it, everyone knows Kickstarter. I don't think I have to explain that. Uh, on Kickstarter, there was a small project. It was called Oculus Rift that raised some money from, from the crowd. And that company ended up uh, being sold to uh, Facebook for $10 billion. But those guys that backed up the project on Kickstarter didn't get much other than, you know, a thank you sticker note. Uh, you know, for that kind of exit. And um, uh, another another project I think that was really good was Twitch. Twitch, you know, being very eccentric, you know, started with Justin Khan, you know, live streaming himself in his room, playing video games. And he um, scaled that idea into Twitch TV, which actually Twitch was sold to Amazon for close to a billion dollars a few years ago. So where I think if Latoken can kind of spin together uh, sort of real time. Um, I think the most important metric is how much someone is willing to give you money. And I think that both MobiPay and Yota in its current form, I wouldn't put my money in because there are still, but, but I'm, I'm also like a strategic investor, right? So we, not only we just say we invest in the project, but we also actually advise the projects and actually provide strategic help to make the projects more sellable to other investors and, and funds. Um, so I think from all perspectives, I think the, the, the ending point is that there is definitely something here. I think we're all on something here, regardless of whether it's the project or it's the token. Or, and I think there is something that we can think more of about how to let these people who are currently watching the show right now. For example, if MobiPay said, hey, guess what? We have a special program where you can you know, instantaneously put in $5, $10, $20, because live, live streaming on Facebook and uh, YouTube allows the user to give tips, right? Sometimes they even tip $100. And instead of tipping, you are actually allowing the viewer to participate in the projects in like a sort of special roadshow round. And I think that could be something even more innovative than the IEO model. I mean, the IEO, the IEO model is just a prerequisite from the ICO and it's stuck between STO. And to be honest, the ICO, IEO, and STO models, nothing has shown the, the, the mass traction that ICO have seen because those times are gone. It is now time to think about innovation. And I think if we spark the right formula and the right model, people want to invest, but just not in the same old way that you know, they have been. So I think think of something new and innovative where it creates win for everyone would definitely be the case. That's my thought. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jason. Thanks for that uh, extra explanation and feedback. Thank you. Uh, Anna, would you like to take that question? Yes, so um, looking at those two um, projects, I actually like um, very much Jason's um, input when he actually mentioned about um, a little bit of the donating. So it's, uh, it's, it reminds me a little bit of the crowdfunding. 
um, online when you have this roadshow. This actually uh, gives a possibility for people to just add the token um, to, to the companies and the companies this way can create some money. So this is something for the future um, to think about. And maybe Jason actually can advise you more about how to do it so uh, the companies can benefit from it as well. Okay, so when we talk about those um, two companies, um, Yota, um, I, I think, you know, like the, the project is, um, it, it's very it's very technical, as I mentioned at the beginning, but it has its grounds. And, and we're still talking right now when it comes to the economy, when we have to develop right now so much, and a lot of companies will have to actually um, innovate, will not have really a choice. And we're getting into this digital economy, um, it's very important for the projects like that to be available and uh, and, and work with, with the customers and work with, with other companies as well. So, like, for me, it is, like, how Yota can... Um, can, can transition themselves also to the to to the future cooperation with different um, with different uh, blockchains, and we're talking about this interoperability and how everything can be done. So I think you know, looking from the bigger perspective, they need to look into it. But um, it is um, a, a good pro a good project to invest, pertaining that certain things are are being um, kind of smooth smooth and and there is also of course um the issue with um exactly with 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 whom they are working with it's always very important to be customer centric and see exactly what what it can be done from that perspective when we talk about um mobile pay um again the regulatory issue is very important. Again, if you if you if you're dealing with different clients, you have to make sure that those points are actually very much very much covered. So, um, I think it's a very good thing that people will have the option to use different wallets and different um, uh, pay uh, applications because every application is a little bit different and everything depends what people like. And sometimes they feel much more comfortable with one versus another. Um, although you mentioned also different regions in the world. So again, I think it, it's also very good to, to focus and see exactly towards what customers you are making your application for, because there's a different customer in Africa, there's a different customer in, in, in Asia, and there's a different customer in, in America. So like staying focused in it and, you know, like channeling that, that gives also the investors a bigger perspective, um, exactly what they are investing in. And nowadays, it's it's very important that those um, those companies like simply showcasing their value. So ICOs days are of course over, and. Um, what is the underlying value for those companies that they presenting um, to to the customers and to the investors? That actually brings everything brings everything together and give um, kind of insights for the person like to invest it or not. Great, thank you, thank you, Anna. Thanks a lot. I'd like to ask both Moby Pay and Yota, what what because we had a very good feedback very elaborate, very comprehensive feedback from all the ju judges regarding both the projects. So what do you think about uh, the feedback and what do you think about our VCTV initiative, like these online roadshows? How has it helped you? I'd like to start with maybe Gary. Yes, yeah, so it, it's always very good to get feedback. And, and yes, being from academia and the way we are, we are very PowerPoint orientated and not necessarily PR orientated. Um, but we take everything on board and we that is the key to doing this is to understand what people's perceptions are and to get the technology that we are doing and we are proposing is quite a lot of times over overcomplicated and it's about putting that message across so it's been very positive for me um it's very good to get the feedback and how we can evolve and not just as a company but also from a marketing and pr perspective 
Um, because everywhere we go, we get positive feedback. And every time we change, it's the first time I've done this online. I'm normally on a stage in front of people. Um, and that that is something that is new. But no, it, it's been very positive. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Thanks a lot. Uh, Brandon, same question. What do you think about the feedback? Um, and what do you think about these sessions? Yeah, no, I, I, I think the feedback is great. Um, I, I love I love the initiative that you're doing with uh, Low Token uh, TV. Uh, there, one suggestion I may have uh, just for the flow, I would say that from the judge's perspective, uh, maybe before providing feedback, asking a few questions about the project, because I think that would clarify a lot of the feedback that may have not been trans transmitted through, through that. Um, and that's kind of, I think that, like, for instance, a lot of questions about regulatory issues, you know, I, those would have been addressed, um, you know, in a couple questions. So, um, because it gives, a, it maybe gives people the sense that those things aren't there, which they, they are. So I would just say that would be my positive feedback on it all, uh, just as far as the flow is concerned, but the feedback was absolutely spot on. Uh, I agree with, you know, everything that everyone said. So I really appreciate that. And it's, it's been a great experience. Awesome, fantastic. We'd love to hear that from all of, uh, all of the speakers today. So that um, uh, brings us to the end of the session today. I would like to pass the floor to my uh, co-moderator, Nadia, to uh, just uh, speak a few lines about our roadshows, um, the VCTV initiative that we have from La Token. Over to you, Nadia. Uh, thank you so much. So we welcome all the participants to uh, take part, not only in the roadshows, but Startup Leaders Club, where we have serial entrepreneurs and investors sharing the current influence of the COVID-19 on the global tech and uh, crisis 2020 as a fast track to the new reality, as well as business model pivots, where you can uh, share your success cases, as well as participate in um, keynotes and masterclasses. Uh, we also have today our Startup Leaders Club in uh, just uh, um, a couple of hours and uh, also a keynote discussion from uh, one of our uh, investor speakers. So thank you so much for participating in our today's roadshow and um, please advise new formats of interaction between serial entrepreneurs and investors and uh, welcome to our roadshows. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you, all the speakers. Thanks for your valuable time. Thank you. Take care and stay safe. Thank you. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.